We're off to South Africa, but this time in the 1970s, when leaders of the African National Congress, the ANC, were in exile, plotting to overthrow the apartheid government. Over the years, the military wing of the ANC used targeted strikes and bomb attacks, but some tactics were very different. In 1971, two young communists were approached in London and asked to go to South Africa to make so-called leaflet bombs, devices which exploded like a firework in public areas, showering ANC pamphlets everywhere. Those two men were Sean Hosey and Steve Marsling, and they're joining us in the studio this morning. Good morning, Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Thanks Good very morning. much for coming in. Steve, why were you approached in the first place? Um, I, I don't really know. I was uh, approached by um, Bob Allen, who was the um, district secretary of the Young Communist League, and he said um, he knew I was actively involved in the anti-apartheid movement as well, um, and he asked me if I would be prepared to meet someone who might give me a task uh, to go to South Africa and uh, would I be prepared to do so? So I said, well, have an open mind. Did he tell you what he wanted you to do? Not at that time, no. Right. No. Um, and he asked me if I knew anybody else who might be interested because there needed two of us and I said, um, well, Sean Hosey and he, he knew Sean as well and he said, yes, that'll be brilliant. So we went off to meet um, Ronnie Casrals, who Ronnie is, um, was um, a leading member of the um, African National Congress, and he explained to us what the task would be. And there were a lot of South Africans in exile at, in London at that time, weren't there? So the movement was very strong. And, and Sean, when Steve talked to you about going to, well, I suppose, getting involved in a struggle for a cause in a distant country, what were your first thoughts? Well, I think it's important to remember... Um, the tenor of the time, the feeling against apartheid that was around in those times. I mean, anti-apartheid was preached from the pulpits in many churches across the land. Many families boycotted South African produce, didn't buy their fruit. And then there was, of course, the, the uh, Stop the Springboks campaign, mm. which was the all-white touring teams. So, you know, it's very difficult to describe to today's audience quite what the pitch of moral outrage against apartheid was at those times. And we had, Steve and I had been, uh, as he said, participating in anti-apartheid activities. I'd been on the anti-tour um, campaign. So uh, although I reflected for a short period of time, the decision to go was, uh, was, was easy, it, but, an but opportunity to take another step which mm. might help defeat apartheid. It's one thing, though, both of you being involved in marches in London, yes. um, uh, anti-apartheid marches. It's another thing, isn't it, to be asked to go to South Africa and create these so-called leaflet bombs. I mean, they, they weren't... Obviously, we won't go into the details of how they were created. They were basic. There was no intention to harm. But were you concerned that you were getting involved in something which was a step up from what you... Used? Yes, we were because we were told quite clearly what would happen to us if we were caught. No one tried to hide the fact that it was dangerous, but it was an opportunity, I think both of us felt, it was an opportunity to show solidarity with people who were living in terrible, oppressive times. And, Sean, you practised making them here in London, didn't you? And yes. And setting them off yes. as well. Yes, I mean, publicly. the word bomb is a bit of a misnomer, and obviously um, I don't want to go into details, uh, because I've been told not to for one reason, yes. but, <laughs> <laughs> and it's inappropriate. But suffice it to say that they were um, not anti-personnel issues. The ANC, as you pointed out earlier, did not engage in indiscriminate anti-personnel activities, even though they might well have done which probably helped the reconciliation at a later date, actually. So they were quite simple devices, and um, we were taught how to take uh, the leaflets in, uh, in a false bottom suitcase. It sounds very, uh, very amazing, um, but that's how it was done. It and seems did, incredible in those days say? that that could have happened. The leaflets, basically... I, I mean, at the time, in the early 70s, as you've said, many, many of the ANC um, had had to leave the country. Many others, with Mandela, uh, the whole leadership of the ANC, had been put into prison for life or very long terms. And so there was this hiatus, if you like, right at the beginning of the 70s, before the trained young men could come back into the country and before the Soweto uprising took place. There was an interlude w w which we had to help to fill. Mm. The, bo the, the leaflet said, the ANC lives... The ANC is still here for you. Our young men are away being trained. They will be coming back. And when they do, 
support right. them in the anti-apartheid struggle. So it was a reminder that the ANC still existed, although they were in exile. So it was a psychological yes. waiting game, but, but was, conducted yeah. in a very practical way. So you yes. had to smuggle out these leaflets and get them into South Africa yes. in yes. these false bottom Correct. suitcases. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were you ever discovered? Did, were there any suspicions raised when people um, saw you? Not really, no. Um, we we had some some f- near misses on the way. Um, we we had to assemble in a kind of bucket um, the firework like device because the whole idea was that we would set a certain time up and they would just go up in the air. The leaflets would go up in the air and people would um, you know be able to run and catch them and you know because it, obviously handing out a leaflet in South Africa against the government was illegal. Mm. You've got a five-year prison sentence uh, under the Suppression of Communism Act, which was a catch-all act. And so that was what we what we did. So you had five of these, these bucket devices That's and you right. went to central Cape Town. What happened when you set them off? <sighs> well, well, I mean, unbeknown to us, at exactly the same time in four of the major South African cities... Other people were doing exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So we were not aware of that, of course, for security reasons. So what happened is, on a particular day, at five o'clock precisely in the afternoon, five or six of these devices went off in all the major cities of South Africa, and it had the most amazing effect on on the government and on the press. The Prime Minister was livid, um, and they were shocked and knocked back on their heels that the ANC was capable of conducting something like this. Yes, it made front front page news on all their newspapers uh, the next day. It was a big, big, big issue in, in, in South Africa at the time. Now, as you were saying, they weren't designed to harm, but were you concerned that they may do? I mean, these yes. were very small firework like mm. devices, but they were going off as, as black workers were, were coming out. Yes, we were concerned, out. and they were going off precisely in the area of black workers, and they were the last people we wanted to, to hurt. Mm. I mean, all I can say to you is that over... Three or four years when many, many such operations took place, not a single person was injured by any of these devices. In and fact, I- the only person that was nearly injured was myself. <laughs> 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 because one of the devices um, had a life of its own and I set the timer and immediately, for about 20 minutes, and immediately it started to roll back towards naught to go right. off within a couple of seconds. Rather stupidly, in hindsight, I jammed my fingernail in between the device and just managed to get it and move it across so that it would just stick and then held our breath. Um, I thought Sean was giving me his best Oliver Hardy look at the yeah. time <laughs> <laughs> and um, wiped the sweat off my brow. All right. Well, Sean and Steve, you're staying with us because when you came back, you were asked to go on a, another mission, Steve, and it had rather disastrous consequences for Sean. So we'll find more about that after the news uh, with Chris Aldridge. That was Chris Aldridge with the news. And this is Saturday Live with Sean Williams and Richard Coles. Christopher Frayling, art and design champion, is with us until 10.30. We have Chips with JP and Giles Corrin and the inheritance tracks of one of Hitchcock's iciest heroines. He is the ultimate actor, the ultimate... He sings, he dances, he... I don't know what he can't do. He hasn't shown anybody what he can't do yet. And besides that, he's Puss in Boots. The inheritance tracks of Tippy Hedron coming up. But just before the news, though, we were hearing the story of Sean Hosey and Steve Marsling, two young British men who were recruited by the ANC in the 70s to go to South Africa to make so-called leaflet bombs, explosives, which showered leaflets in public places with an ANC message on them. Now, when they came back, Steve was asked if he wanted to go on another mission. Steve, you couldn't go, and Sean went in your place. Did you know what the mission was? Uh, yes, yes, the mission was explained to us. Um, on the face of it, it seemed more straightforward than the first. It was simply to take um, some money and passports in for some, uh, some of our African comrades who, as I said earlier, had had to leave the country but were now beginning to come back in. To operate within South Africa, they had to have passports. People might remember the hated passports, yeah. which mm-hmm. uh, restricted the movement of African black people in South Africa, so they needed those. So my mission was to take in uh, money and passports for four of those people. Um, unfortunately, uh, when I got there, we discovered that they'd already previously been arrested and under torture had unfortunately revealed a code word uh, which was a warning to us uh, and the South African security police had worked out how to delete that warning code word, hence it was a trap. 
Right. And so what happened? Um, well, I turned up at the uh, venue to meet the uh, person I was supposed to, gave the appropriate password. Uh, he took the documents from me. I turned away. He said, hold it, boss, which was clearly a warning to me because only uh, the boss was the word used by black people to subservient uh, black people to white people. And I knew that uh, Mike Romney would not have used that term and turned round to be faced by four or five people with significant uh, firepower in their hands and I was arrested. And you were tried? Um, you were in solitary confinement before the trial? Well, um, all of these stories are revealed, of course, in our, in our book about the matter, London Recruits, which is about to be released. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> nice plug one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Details uh, on the well, website. Well, I want to plug it. Um, <laughs> But in my own experience and talking to other people, uh, the pattern of treatment of political prisoners became uh, quite clear and it happened to me. The, there was a sort of menu, if you like, which the security police chose their actions from. The starter invariably in all cases was severe and prolonged physical assaults. For example, um, I, I had it, but they, even then they reserved their racist treatment for black people uh, who received much worse treatment. I can confirm that two of my colleagues had their toenails removed and such severe beatings that they have permanent injuries. The second, if you like, the main course was uh, usually a long period of solitary confinement to soften people up and disorientate them. Periods, months and months and months. My own was, in, was eight months. Um, and then they had some uh, fun and games with little tactics, for example, um, which I experienced again and, and a lot of other people experienced. They would take you out in the middle of the night into a mealy meal or a sugar cane field uh, into the middle of it where a hole would be, a grave-like hole. You would be forced to kneel down and then suddenly behind your ear a very large pistol noise would be made, probably a starting pistol. Of course, invariably, the, the reaction to that is to move away from the sound of the pistol and you would tumble into the grave uh, and they would have you believe that this was your grave. And then you were taken back to jail and put back into solitary confinement and were, in, were on death row for a while. Yes, well, uh, I'll share that with you if I may. It's a bit harrowing, but okay. uh, yes, I did spend some time in Pretoria. We were all, all political prisoners were in Pretoria maximum security and they, they segregated white and black prisoners even to that extent. Their racism knew no bounds. So the black prisoners were on Robin Island and we were in Pretoria. Part of my time, though, was spent at the... Uh, condemned section of Pretoria's central prison, where <clears throat> invariably there were at least 100 people awaiting execution. Um, and in my time there, I experienced uh, quite amazing scenes. Thursday was hanging day. They hung seven or eight people uh, together. The gallows could cope with that. And on Tuesdays, the note from the state president notifying the seven or eight who were to be hung would be received at the prison preposterously started with the word greetings. Um, <laughs> how are you? How yeah. are you? Yes, here's your, here's your death warrant. Um, but what was astonishing was the level of support for those uh, condemned people that happened between the Tuesday evening and the Thursday morning. And that took the form of everybody singing. And they sang for 36 hours. You'd be interested Gosh. in this, Christopher. Mm. Sang uh, so movingly, fantastically, in that deep African rhythmic mm. sound, unaccompanied just the voice. All they had were their voices, but they uh, fought back. So, and to get the condemned through the night, and through the, they'd through get the, the condemned hours. through 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 the day and the night, and then they could hear the people being the, the condemned coming out of their cells at six in the morning on the Thursday, where the singing rose to an absolute crescendo. Uh, I, nothing I've ever experienced before or since equates with that pulsating sound rising to a crescendo. Um, heart-rending, gut-wrenching music. The power of the human voice. Mm, the power of the human voice hit me in a way that I, you know, I never understood. And the solidarity of it all. Everyone and the solidarity of it all. Through voice, yeah. that, that, was their way, that was their way of solidarity with the condemned. It was um, a killing factory. You were jailed for five years. Yes. And uh, while you were in jail, you were allowed to do some learning, which seems remarkable. Well, I need to qualify that. Um, I mean, there... The cruelty of the regime extended to all political prisoners in the sense that we were deprived of news. Now, it's hard to imagine, isn't it, 
being deprived of all newspapers, all broadcasting, all magazines, yeah. all news of the world for a long period of time. Some of them uh, had to suffer this for 13 or 14 years. Now, however, a concession to some of us younger ones was that we were permitted to study. But, of course, because you couldn't get books which covered any news after about 1950, that rather restricted <laughs> your choice. Yes. My choice was ancient philosophy and logic. I thought I'd be okay. safe with that. But there's one little amusing anecdote I can tell you. We did have trouble with, with books. The South African Prison Service is regimented on military, uh, military lines. The head of the prison service is Brigadier Ocamp. And we noticed over a period of time that we were getting less and less books. So we asked for a meeting with Brigadier Ocamp, a very dour old Afrikaner he was. He came to the prison. We said, well, why are we not getting our books, Brigadier? He said, ah... Well, you people think you're very clever. I won't try and do the Afrikaner race. You people think you're very clever, but we know that study books are hard books, hardback books, and reading books are softback books. So you're getting no softback books because you're only allowed <laughs> study books. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about this for, for so much longer, but, but the, the, the upsum of this is you, you, you were there for five years, you came out, you came back to the UK, yeah. um, awarded a scholarship at Warwick University, and, and somebody has tweeted that the students named the bar after you. Yes, they did. That was very kind of them. It's sort of act of solidarity. I mean, I, I need to add that, that in my time away, both for me and all political prisoners, there was tremendous support for us from my family, from many friends. People did all sorts of fundraising activities, and it was amazing. But you asked them to change the Well, name. it didn't seem right that it should remain in my name when I'd left people behind, so I asked them to change it to the name of one of my comrades who was remaining in prison called Theophilus Chola. Sean Hosey and Steve Marsling, thank you very much.